All righty, we are live on Facebook, boys. Be ready for it. Come on, Mitch, on your toes. <laughs> See, I think, I think this part of the video is Chase's favorite part. It is. Every because he, he he naturally just talks and he knows he's not supposed to, but he does. Still, the only time he knows he can talk. This is usually the only information no, I get. I've never said he can yes. talk in the beginning in the chase. Part. What are we, what are we name the chase part again? I forget. Hashtag no chase. Chase period. Chase period. That's right. So it doesn't mean you get to talk, even though it's chase period. Chase just knows it. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Check this out. Chase has got his purple one on. <laughs> yeah. With the green shorts. Wait, is, are mm. those underwear? <laughs> they are. They kind of look like underwear. And Don't I, be jealous. Uh, well, definitely not jealous. I wouldn't be surprised. I know that. So today is. Tech Tuesday. Chase, do you have all your stuff in order? We We're did. live. We're on. I, I believe right. so. I got people already firing away questions, but let's give everyone a little bit of feel of what we're going for today. So here's the deal. To be completely honest with you guys, um, I had no idea what we we're going to talk about until about five minutes ago, because <laughs> there's it's like Chase has graphics. I mean, he's not coming in here and putting on the Batman pow cow. He's doing the this and this. So dumb. <laughs> the, <laughs> no. <laughs> <clears throat> So, uh, Mitch and I were up in Flagstaff testing a little bit of stuff today. Woohoo! And so we literally just drove in right this second, five minutes ago, and said, all right, what can we do? It's Tech Tuesday, so keep it technical. Um, there's nothing more technical than front end geometry. So we figured we'd talk to you guys about front end design when it comes to off road cars, which is a lot different uh, as to what you should be concentrating on when it comes to these things than a road race car. Um, Geometry is very technical. I'm gonna try and go pretty quick. I'm not gonna pay a ton of attention to each particular thing because there's so much involved in front end geometry that I could probably spend an hour just talking about Ackerman or just talking about things we've done in the past like scrub radius when it comes to wheel offset. Try to keep your questions on subject since it's Tech Tuesday. Geometry, all right? What? On Thursday, you guys can throw anything out you want. Luckily for us, I know nothing <clears throat> on this subject. Why are we only talking about the front end geometry, Justin? Um, so Chase, just to let you know that there's many subjects that you know absolutely <laughs> nothing about when it comes to off-road, UTV, or anything we do here, but I'm glad that you don't because you're supposed to only do video. And, and there's Steve in the back, the peanut gallery, just <laughs> laughing at everything because he knows it's true. <laughs> Hi, Steve. So, and you said something about Ackerman, Luke Ackerman. Wasn't he on American Idol? Yeah, see, my point exactly why he should never talk. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. Why don't you throw a question at me? I got I to gotta clean off the board from the last video. There is zero preparation in this one, you guys. So, uh, Daniel Gonza 9, Can Am Live Valve Suspension? Question mark. Can Am Live Valve Suspension? Question mark. All right, so um, that's a good question. And I'm probably going to have to leave it there. <laughs> Again, <clears throat> that's one of those things that if I keep on talking, then I'm going to get a couple of phone calls from people that are going to be mad. Uh, so that's all you get. We got the man, Hayden Thomas. How about this? How about this with the Can-Am suspension? I'll tell you this. If they do it, it would be a really good idea if they did. Um, I'll stop there. What up, Hayden? What's going on, man? <coughs> uh, Matt Burke also says, what's up, guys? Matt, how's it going, buddy? We're going to see you pretty soon, as a matter of fact. So next week at some point on Tuesday. Yep. You guys, uh, I think we're going to have a live feed also with uh, Dirt Live Show. Um, that's George Hamill and also Matt Burke will be on there. He'll give us all kinds of information when it comes to clutching and racing and uh, a whole bunch of other things. Right, Matt? The Dirt Life and Dino Jet mm. all on <coughs> one feed. All right, you guys, um, off the top of my head, there's a few things that you need to be considering when you're talking about front end. You're going to go wheel, tire, and pretty much in this order, wheel, tire, hub, um, axle, no axle, so that's four-wheel drive or not. Um, then you've got overall width. And finally, shock. So in order, wheel. When you're designing suspension, you need to come up with what wheel you're going to run. The reason is the wheel offset determines almost everything. Tire is next. Once you have a tire decided upon, wheel and tire, next thing you're going to do is go to hub. When we talk about hubs, 
you're looking for drive flange, bearing, and this offset from the wheel to the hub inner right here determines what you're going to end up doing for a spindle. I'm making this very simple. This is a great drawing, Justin. No, it's horrible. I really apologize, you guys. But, <clears throat> and I might have to change that according to what I've got drawn out here. Let's say tire center line. You sure your last name's not Ross, Justin? Um, you know, what is his? Ed R Roth. Roth? Roth? R <laughs> well, yeah, Ed Roth would be uh, Ratfink, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm talking about the, no, the, guy, the guy with the who's afro. The guy? Bob the Ross. Guy? Bob, Bob Ross. Ross. <laughs> there we go. Justin Ross. <laughs> All right, I'm going to make this one accurate because it's important. Hashtag no chase. Hashtag no chase. And there's going to be a tie rod on it. All right. Wheel choice, tire choice, hub choice. Hub determines offset from the wheel into the bearing and into the spindle. Spindle design is drawn around kingpin inclination angle. I'm gonna leave all these caps off so I can make this quick. Imaginary line drawn through those that should meet the ground, let's say one inch or less. This right here is scrub radius. So the center line of the tire where it contacts the ground to where this imaginary line drawn through the upper pivot and the lower pivot of the spindle meets this width right here should be under an inch. Then, we've got lower arm, upper arm, frame, and let's say that's the center of the frame, we have the same thing on the other side. That in general is the order in which you're going to determine all of the design parameters for your car. Next in line, once you've got hub and axle, is going to be axle. What I mean by that, is it four-wheel drive or is it two-wheel drive? The reason that I say that is because if it's four-wheel drive and you've got an axle that's going to be driving this hub, the height of this axle position might be determined or it might determine whether it's centered between the upper and lower pivots or if you don't have an axle to drive the system, you can lower the hub down and have that centered off the lower pivot, have a center right there. This is free travel. Uh, it's a limitation in four-wheel drive stuff. So if you have an axle in the middle, and that's the center line of a four-wheel drive car, and this is the center line of a two-wheel drive car, this is like four to six inches of free travel and free gr uh, ground clearance. This is the reason why people can run or why people run a uh, portal hub, because they're trying to take a center line axle position for drive between the upper and lower pivot points of the spindle and they're gearing it down to give them lift and drive the center line of the pivot center line of the hub in a lower position you can go in portals i think you've got two four six eight inch drops in portals as soon as you start dropping a portal below this pivot point say a four inch to a six or an eight you end up with geometry problems when you do that i'll get into that in a minute but that's the thing that would be determined when it comes to a four-wheel drive or not. Width. What's the width that we can run in the car from center line? If you're racing, then last year in our UTV classes, 77 inches overall was your limit. This year it's 80. So knowing that, you would design a complete system on in CAD or on the workbench to an 80 inch overall to the outside of the tire. That determines your control arm lengths. Longer the arm, wider the car, the more travel you can have. Um, last, shock positioning and shock choice. I'm actually gonna go a little bit sideways on that one before we talk about it. Shock can be all kinds of things. You can run an 18 inch long shock on a front suspension that has 18 inches of travel. That just means that the shock's gonna be mounted at the spindle going up. 18 inch shock at the hub basically gives you 18 inches of travel. You, you can mount the shock in the middle of the arm, let's say at the 50% point. And let's say you had a system designed around 20 inches of wheel travel. Since you're at 50%, that would be a 10 inch shock travel. 
mounted at the 50% point would give you 20 inches on the outside. 10 inches here is 20 on the out because it's halfway through or 50% of the mounting point. You can mount them anywhere you want. You can mount them on upper arms, you can mount them on lower arms. Um, one of the reasons that uh, UTV manufacturers mount them to the upper arm is because to keep them from having to get around the axle and steering. So if the shock was all the way down to the lower arm, then they've got an axle in the way, they've got a steering in the way, and they'd have a lower control arm that's fairly complicated and expensive to make. Um, it is actually better to run the shock on the lower arm than it is to run it on the upper arm. I'm going to get back into that here in just a little bit when it comes to shock choice at the very end. But another thing that we haven't touched upon is steering when it comes to where that goes. Um, to me, it does not matter if it's a rear steer or if it's a front steer. There's some debate on whether it's stronger or weaker. If it's a rear steer, then the tie rods tend to get pushed in and you can bend a tie rod pretty easy. If it's in the front, they tend to get pulled out. And when you pull a tie rod apart, they're a lot stronger in, in uh, extension than they are in compression or attention than they are in compression. So I would rather have a box mounted in the front. The reason that most UTV manufacturers don't do that is because it's a pain in the butt with a front differential in the way to mount a rack and have steering shafts get all the way up to the driver. Then you have a shock in the way and some other things too. So a rearward mounted rack is just easier for uh, most UTV manufacturers. Any questions before I go into steering? Uh, Vinny, Amen, can you draw out a diagram of how I can ditch my Honda Talon payments and get a can and Amex? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so. Here is, um, this is the money side of the graph, and this is the fire side of the graph, okay, campfire. All you do as you start throwing more money at this, you throw more fire at it to burn your money off, and then you can go buy another car. <laughs> That's pretty much the graph on how to get rid of your Honda. I apologize. For that. <laughs> uh, one more Spook Factory. Does the four seat Talon have the same geometry issues as the two seater? Yes. So there's very little difference between the four and the two seater when it comes to rear geometry. Um, it's the same. The there's two things that happen when you go to a four seater. The car gets longer which means that all line of force principles are worse. The car will have more bucking strictly because the center of gravity moves forward. The other thing though is as you get to a longer car, the wheelbase is better for the whoops and it timing is better. So longer wheelbase cars run better through the whoops. It's about an even trade. The wheelbase and the center of gravity movement of a four seater about cancel each other out. So you're gonna have about the same performance from a geometry standpoint and a two versus a four. Same is the case with uh, Can-Ams and Polaris's and everybody else too. So, so what are we doing? I'm kind of a little bit lost right now, Justin. We're talking about front end geometry. Shouldn't all front end geometry be perfect from the manufacturer and shouldn't everything I put on my car improve my front end geometry? Mm. So um, you're not gonna get perfect geometry from any of the manufacturers. They have a lot of things to consider. They have tests to pass, rollover tests and things like that. They also have cost. So the design is probably very easy to do, but putting it in practice with a set of upper and lower control arms that aren't gonna cost the factory 300 bucks to make each is also hard. Um, also, they can make sacrifices in performance because most UTV owners don't know what, say, a perfect system rides like or drives like. You're gonna have to be a guy that's raced a lot or driven trophy trucks or driven class one cars or quality 10 cars to know what the potential in a suspension system is. Otherwise, if you're, you're like, hey, I've never driven an off-road car before. I go out and I buy myself a brand new Polaris. And you're like, it's amazing. It rides better than anything in the world. Nothing is better than this. How can you say that if you have nothing else to judge it upon? Have you ever ridden in a car at 140 mile an hour through three foot whoops? If you haven't, then you don't know what good, bad, or otherwise is. So I'm just pointing out different directions that you could go or manufacturers could go. I'm just pointing out things that you should consider just makes you a better uh, consumer, a better customer if you know what good and bad is and why. If you can look at the front end of a car and go, well, that shock angle is too much, it's going to be a problem, then you might be uh, make more informed decisions. So I can't tell you why the factories don't do it perfect. They have a lot of things to consider. Um, and that's all I can say. What do you got, Mitch? 
A uh, couple off topic questions, but let's uh, keep rocking on this. I'll get to those here in just a second. Okay, so let me do a couple more things. When it comes to suspension design, there's a couple of other lines that you want to follow. If you draw an imaginary line through your pivot points on the chassis, actually, I'm going to do it in red so at least it kind of sticks out just a little bit. Wherever those pivot points are, you draw a line through that. Wherever your spindle pivots are, you draw a line through that. When you're setting up your steering, your steering must be on this line, and it must be on this line when it comes to a tie rod position, if you want to have no bump steer. Bump steer is, as the suspension travels up and down, and the tires are towed in or out, let's just say they're towed straight perfect, as it compresses, they tow in, as it droops, they tow out. It could go the other way, it could tow in drooped, and it could tow out compressed. The change in tow is bump steer as it travels. Feeling in the steering wheel is not bump steer. That's just feedback. Bump steer can cause feedback. Other things can cause feedback like wheel offset and suspension setup. So uh, bump steer is literally the change in tow through cycle. In an off-road car, you don't want any. You want as little as you can get, quarter inch or less. Unfortunately, a lot of manufacturers have four inches of bump steer factory. Some have two, some have one, they're all over the board. And also, the same manufacturer can have different bump steer um, cycling on the same car. So for instance, like a Can-Am, in the beginning of the year to the end of the year, they might have four inches of bump steer at the beginning of the year, two inches in the middle on the production run, go back to four inches at the end of the year. Just depends on where everything bolts into the car, rack and pinion location, a lot of other movements and things like that can add up to a lot of bump steer. Back to tie rod. If you have the tie rod on these two imaginary lines, then you will have a system that has zero bump steer. Another thing that you have to consider is the distance between this lower pivot and the tie rod height, and this lower uh, spindle pivot and tie rod height. This percentage and this percentage right here must be the same. The reason I say percentage is because let's just say the distance between pivots is eight inches on the spindle, and it's eight inches over here. And you go come up to here, then you want to come up to here, so the height is the same. What if this is 8 inches over here and this is 10 inches, which is totally possible in suspension design? Then you can't go 2 inches and 2 inches, you have to go by a percent. So 2 inches right here is uh, at 8, what's that, 20%? Right? I'm not, sorry about my mouth. But 20%, and then over here, you want to go 20%. So if that was 10 inches, it would probably be like 2.5. The percentage must be the same. Then you get into things like Ackerman. Well... What's Ackerman? Ackerman is, when you turn the tires, they both turn equally together, all right? The toe never changes, they're both the same at all times. That's zero Ackerman. When you start throwing Ackerman in it, that means when you turn, the inside one turns farther than the outside one. That's Ackerman. You can put more in it, you can put less in it. The reason is, when a car turns through a corner, the inside tire is on a smaller radius and needs to be turned a little further than the outside one for both of them to make the corner without hopping out in and out from a traction problem. Ackerman is actually um, pretty easy to do. All you do is you move that tire rod pivot point out wider. The wider that pivot point is off this imaginary kingpin line, the more Ackerman you end up with. The right way to figure this out is, back to the black pen. See that's the rear of the car, front of the car. And remember, this is chicken scratch, so don't go, you know, <laughs> yelling at me about my designs, all right? Looks like an RS1. It could be, it's kind of a single seater, don't you think? Hashtag, no cheese. So what you do is you draw an imaginary line through the rear of the car and through that front spindle. An imaginary line over here. A good starting spot for Ackerman would be that you have your tie rod mounts on that imaginary line, which is wider than the kingpin line is if it's in the front. It's actually narrower than the kingpin line is if it's a rear steer like most UTVs. That will give you approximately a good starting point for accurate Ackerman. That's funny. Accurate, 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 accurate Ackerman. Ackerman. Yeah. 
What's what's the benefit of, of uh, more or less Ackerman? So if you have more Ackerman, turn the wheel and it, it's this is very little Ackerman. Turn the wheel and it's a lot of Ackerman. You're basically setting a car up to turn better in a very smaller radius corner. So if we're talking about NASCAR, then there would be like, um, I forget the name of the track back east and wherever, but it's only like a quarter mile track and the um, banked oval, small course. Someone's going to give it to me, watch real quick. Um, yet. Concrete oval, uh, the concrete monster, I forget what it's called. So that's a tight track and you would set up the Ackerman to be exactly the same or needed inner turn for the radius of that corner. More Ackerman for tight corners. If you go to say Talladega or Daytona, that's a very, very big wide corner, maybe more like a half a mile radius. And then you'd have less Ackerman for that big wide corner so that both tires are exactly in the right spot. Bristol. Arc. Bristol. Thank you, Bristol. I haven't watched NASCAR in years. <laughs> Sorry, that was more of a Formula Star One. Star 77 said that. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Star 77. Appreciate it. If you throw too much Ackerman in it, then it tends to push. Uh, it doesn't have the traction. If you don't put enough Ackerman in it, it's a little bit uh, less of a negative effect. You're not going to notice it in the dirt. The reason we talked about this suspension being an off road design is because there's a lot of things I'm not touching upon that are strictly for road racing. Um, instant center, roll center. Um, all of these things are only good in suspension design if the A-arms are flat and level and it only travels through compression three inches. If you design a system that they're flat and level and you've got all of these turning and body roll um, things designed into it, they can throw them all out the window as soon as the A-arms are drooped out. That's why off-road doesn't take all of those other things into consideration. So I don't want to hear all you guys that are circle track guys who are dealing with these things on a regular basis telling me that I didn't even cover it. Okay, and off-road, when you've got two feet of wheel travel, it's not even in the book. Don't even even, even worry about it. What about guys who uh, <laughs> want to replace, uh, let's say, their stock A-arms or anything mm -hmm. like that, aftermarket, best setup, best, uh, best A-arm, basically, for their car? Um, well, again, I'm just going to defer back to the companies that we prefer to use. So I think that Lone Star, Cognito... Geyser, um, you know, companies like that that have been around a long time build a quality arm that doesn't break. Um, they're going to keep factory geometry. Um, they're not going to divert from that. They're not going to have um, issues with quality control and maybe adding a little more caster or camber to the car when you don't want it. So I would just go for the top companies and those are the ones we like to use. Anything else? I'm going to ditch this and I'm going to go. Uh, yeah, let's do one more question here. <coughs> the one and only bucket on a Maverick X3 64 inch. How does a 5.5 offset wheel affect the front end geometry? Okay, so a 5.5 would be center offset. So you got 10 inch wheel and in the, the center of the hub is in the middle. It would absolutely ruin that car. Completely ruin the geometry in the front. You'd have so much wheel feedback, it'd probably be hard to hold on to. So never do that. You're going to want a 5.1 or a 5.2 which is a six or seven inch wheel where the offset is mostly inboard and the center of the wheel is on the outside with very little lip. I know everybody wants a lip on the tire, okay, on the wheel, it looks great, but the more lip you throw on it, the more offset is a negative and the more steering is a problem. All right, what else? Gone with the Honda money burning graph. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. For everyone just Not my tuning graph, in, what he what he was asking for? Yeah, that, that, was, that was that was pretty good. <clears throat> for everyone tuning just in right now, Justin, kind of give us a breakdown. So what we're doing is we're kind of going over the general terms of front end geometry. If you're going to ever design one, or if you're going to look at one, you can see what goods and bads are. Um, we've discussed wheel offset and then hub. Those two things have to happen first with tire choice, so you can design a spindle. Once you've designed a spindle and you've got accurate kingpin ankle, an inclination angle, which gives you scrub radius that's accurate. Once you have a spindle, then you can design arms and you can design a frame mount. Once you've got that, then you can look at steering placement and you can look at shock position. That's the order in which you would do it. Otherwise, if you do frame mounts first, then you're pigeon-toed into a system that may not work with the right wheel and tire. South Bay Drone, <coughs> what does it mean when they sell a lower A-arm with a one and a quarter forward? One and a quarter forward on lower A-arm means that they've moved the arm, the tire forward in wheelbase. So let's do this. Here's your car, and there's a stock A-arm. 
This is a one and a quarter forward. I'm exaggerating, but basically they've moved the tire forward in the car. That's the front, that's the back. Sorry, front. Screw my arrows. They just moved the tire forward. The reason they're doing that usually is to give you more clearance to the firewall so you can run a taller tire and still have it clear the firewall when it turns and goes in. Usually though, a forward mounted A-arm isn't required to put big tires on most of these UTVs. What's required is the right wheel offset. If you have a wheel that's set inward then you have no geometry problems, it will usually clear the firewall and fenders. On a Polaris, you can put a 35. On a Can MX3, you can put a 35 stock arms, as long as the wheel offset's right. When you kick the wheel out wider, then what that does, <clears throat> I'm gonna do it over here. Let's just say you, if, this, if you put a wheel on it that kicks the tire way out, then as you turn it, it swings into the body and hits right away. If you can tuck it in with the right wheel offset, it'll turn and it'll clear. It turns in faster instead of turning right into it. So I'm not, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with forward mounted A-arms, um, but usually the reason people are putting them on there is for more tire and that's because they got the wrong wheel. A really good question here. Big MCC awesome. Does that mean more Ackerman co angle causes more bump steer as you're moving your tie rod mount off the scrub line? Yeah, um, so no. Um, the, the answer is yes and no and I'll tell you why. So if you've got uh, frame mounts right here, you've got a spindle here, a crude spindle, okay, with a bearing hub out here upper arm, lower arm, pivot line, I need to leave these caps off all day, there we go, pivot line, and pivot line, you're going to put the tie rod right there, let's just say that's where you're going to put it, and you want those on those pivot lines, right? Well, I just said Ackerman means you're gonna move this one out. And if you had proper Ackerman, I'm gonna guess it's about a half an inch off the line for most wheelbases. The longer the wheelbase, the more it's gonna be, the less it's kicked out. The shorter the wheelbase, the more it's kicked out. If you just did this and moved the tie rod mount out wider, it would have a ton of bump steer, probably four to six inches. The way to cure it is if that moved one inch, then you move this one one inch. Now this is off the line an inch, and this one is off the line an inch. That's the same as being on the line on both sides. You now have zero bump steer, but you have proper Ackerman. That's the way you cure that. Um, where was I going? I had something I was going to. It's gonna be shocks. Back to shocks. Frame mount. Lower arm. Where do you put a shock? Spindle again. The best place to put a shock is if you know what your fully compressed location is for the suspension. How do you figure out fully compressed? I don't know, let's just say you got a 35 inch tire and the frame's right here. The way you figure out fully compressed is what is your ground clearance going to be? Four to six inches when this is completely bottomed out. Let's just pretend that that would be completely bottomed out. Tire position. And your arm is a, roughly going to be right here, fully compressed. Your lower arm up here with four inches of ground clearance, maybe six. Fully compressed, that's where your suspension is gonna be. Your shock should be 90 degrees to that line. Imaginary shock, right? Loop, fully compressed to the mount. The reason that you want it 90 degrees 
fully compressed is because that's where the shock has the most leverage or resistance against the arm. That's where the shock is the stiffest when it's 90 degrees. That means that the shock shaft is moving the same amount of distance as the arm is. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. When you droop this system out, let's say it droops over here. I'm just gonna freewheel that. And let's say that your tire fully drooped out. A very flat, screwed up tire, by the way. <laughs> same position, shocks now this way. This lack of angle means that when this moves up two inches, this shaft might move one. Two to one ratio. That means that your car automatically feels softer and more plush when this system is drooped. As it is compressed and as you're approaching a 90 degree angle, this goes from two to one to one and a half to one to one to one. And that system gives you automatically a, a scaled up compression curve without having to do it with spring and when I, without having to do it with valving. So that is a geometric way of getting a plush ride when you want it and a stiffer system when it's needed without having to fake it with valving and with coil spring. So that's actually really, really, really important. You don't see any UTVs with 90 degree arm mounting. The reason that they don't do it is because if they did, this mount is gonna be above most hoods of most of these vehicles, okay? And that's gonna be in your face. You're gonna see this right in front of you and you're not gonna see over the hood. So manufacturers start leaning them over and mounting them where you can actually see. This extra angle means that you take a lot more coil spring, it takes a lot more valving, to slow the suspension down because the shock has a lot more leverage against it when it's leaned in. That's also why earlier in the, this little feed, I said it's a really good idea to mount shocks to the lower arm, but people don't do it because you've got axles and steering in the way. The reason it's a good idea to mount it to the lower arm is because this overall mount is lower at the hood. Now I drew, drew this on the lower arm, but imagine if it was on the upper arm. That upper is gonna be up here I'm really getting where you can't see this anymore, <laughs> right? But that upper is going to have a shock 90 degree off of it. And if it was the same length shock we were dealing with before, our other one was mounted here. This is why you can't see over a shock if it's mounted 90 degrees in a UTV. And this is also why they mount them over here, to keep it below the hood at sacrificing geometry potential to do that. So that's one of the reasons why manufacturers don't have perfect suspension, because they're trying to package it in something that you can see. If they put it up, raise the hood to make the geometry better, then people will probably complain about seeing over the hood and looking at rocks. So there's always gonna be give and take. Um, whether they can do it uh, the way that we would like it, or the way they like it, or whether their customers like it, that's a decision for the boardroom, and I can't tell you how they do that. What do you got, Mitch? Uh, a couple questions on offsets of wheels. Uh, 12 look four. So what I understand, a 3-2 offset is ideal for steering and control and for no bump steer. Uh, Don Mandot, 5-1 or 5-2? So a, the, who said 3-2 offset? That's not accurate. The so, uh, 3-2 offset, 12 look four. Okay, so here's how offsets work. Wheel, wheel lip, hub portion of the wheel. I'm looking at a wheel as if you cut it in half. And this is the thick portion that uh, you're gonna have lug nuts coming out of, right? From the hub. You only got about a one inch visual on the outside lip. Tire would be like this if this was cut in half. This would be representative of a 5-1. One inch of lip on the outside, and it's not, a, I'm just being totally um, generic here, okay, you guys. One inch on the outside, five inch on the inside gives you a total of a six inch wheel. Okay, that's the right offset for 90% of the UTVs. If you really want to, then you can go to a 5.2. That's a two inch on the outside. Blows the tire out a little wider. But it doesn't give you that much for negative geometry. That would be a seven inch wheel five plus two, okay? When you say a four four or a three three, okay, that is a center wheel. 
tire, tire, four inch, four inch. Okay, that's really, really bad for geometry as you start moving the tire out wider because you took wheel away from the inside and you moved it out. The geometry goes to hell and you get a lot of feedback in the wheel. The one that he was talking about is a 3-2? 3-2, yeah. Well, I mean, a 3-2 would be... If this was three inches, that would be two. That's still bad. You want to have one inch on the outside, two inches on the outside, max. If this really was a 3-2, you'd be okay. Um, typically, though, we only see four ones, five ones, and five twos. Three two is pretty oddball. Um, and then the next question was whether on a five one or five two. Five one or five two. You're totally safe on almost every UTV with a five one or five two. Um, I would la rather see a, a one, but you can. You're okay. You're not going to get too much feedback with a five two. So another question from Changle one one two zero. Would a thirty two inch tire for a sixty four inch X three with a five two offset clear on the front and the back? Yeah. Absolutely. No problem. We see him here all the time. Justin, what is your thoughts on the new Speed UTV coming out? Speed UTV looks pretty amazing to me. Um, Robbie knows what he's doing. I've said it before. He's been in off-road a million years. He knows what good and bad is. He's driven what good and bad feeling suspension is. I'm sure it's going to come out awesome. From what I've seen on some of the live feeds, it is. And he's giving a lot of thought to the car as we are with trying to describe how to do it. He's doing the same things on his car. So having not seen one or driven one, I think it will probably pre be pretty awesome. I'm going to reserve all other opinions until after he gives me a car and we go drive it. I uh, got one from Mike. NAC04 on a YXZ. Are X2s better than the RC2s <coughs> after RAS, Spring Kit, and IQS? Or would they be the same? Also, what about X2s versus RC2s with RAS, Spring Kit, but no IQS? Okay, so that's way too much. Uh, you lost me at the <laughs> so, beginning. Um, when you X2 what? X2 is better than RC2s. X2, what's an X2? Bypass? The dual adjuster shock. High speed, um, low speed rebound. On what car? On YXZ. On a YXZ, okay. Yeah. For some reason, I thought we were talking about an X3. I'm like, why is an X2 on an X3? Too Sorry. many X's. There's a lot of X's there. Right? <clears throat> okay, so um, I think that the dual adjuster X2 shock, which is basically an internal bypass, rides better on a YXZ than the, any of the previous stuff. Um, I would probably run IQS on an X2. You can run the IQS on the compression knob and then you can control, control compression up and down and leave the rebound one as a manual control. So um, the difference, okay, IQS isn't gonna make your car ride better. It's gonna make you a better driver by being able to adjust your car on the fly. So if it rides a, a, out of a one to a 10, if it rides a 10 with manual control, it's still gonna ride a 10 with automatic electronic control. It's just that you can control what it does and when. So IQS um, doesn't just fix uh, bad cars. It just makes it so you can change and adjust on the fly. Um, what well, do you got, Chase? I feel like I know so much more, Justin, about this. I think what I'm getting at all this is that everything has rhyme and reason. You can't just throw stuff on the car and expect the geometry to do its job. With well, that yeah, being so said... With not knowing anything about what you just said, Chase, I mean, I know you had no clue what you just said. No idea. No <laughs> idea. I know you had no Hold idea, on. but I'm you actually said some stuff that's important. You're right. Everything is interdependent... <laughs> <laughs> I lost you. Don't worry. Interdependent upon itself. There are so many things that have to be sacrificed in front-end geometry to gain in some other spot. So if you want some specific area to be better than another, you're probably going to sacrifice something. Now you just want to make sure you sacrifice stuff that isn't important in off-road. Um, you can also ruin everything by the wrong wheel, and that's why we keep going back to wheel and tire choice. It's always something that you can bolt on and ruin the car with. Um, it, you can still drive it. It's just hard to drive, and it really kicks back in the wheel and you know makes your arms go to sleep because it's a lot rougher and doesn't track very well and it ruins front end geometry, it ruins front end parts. Start wearing out stuff early if you have the wrong wheel offset. So uh, yeah, that's why we harp on it a lot because that ultimately is making your car ride good and that's what we do. So that's why we tell you about it. Hold on real quick, Justin. I feel like we gotta do something before we go here. I got an, uh, something that could get you maybe a little bit in trouble here and it's just an opinion. Theoretically here, 
What is your I UTV with your favorite front end suspension geometry? And this could probably surprise some people. And what is your UTV with your least favorite front end suspension geometry? Mm. Strictly from the front end, I think that the KRX has the best design, um, followed by the Wildcat Double X. Um, and I might even I might even switch my opinion around between the two of those depending on how and where you're driving. But I think those are the best geometry that are on the market at, at the moment. Um, worst geometry is going to be... Don't you say it. Your favorite. Chase. Don't say it. I'm going to make you say it, Chase. Oh, George and I are going to be so upset with Chase, you if you say Chase, what's your this. favorite car? Uh, I believe it's the Yamaha, the YXC, the greatest car of all time. Yes. Yes, Chase. I think it's the worst geometry. And here's why... You guys, it's because they lay the shock over at the worst angle of all UTVs made. Um, also, there's no anti-dive built into that car. There's a whole bunch of other things that have been easy to do in front end geometry in that car that weren't done. Um, now, yeah, that's all I'm going to say right there. Well, I mean, YXC does so many things that are really good. It's just that they, it does so many things well that require like a flat track or you know, Lucas Oil or turning a corner. They turn a corner, man. They really, really do. But they're just not going to tackle big, rough stuff like some of the other cars are going to do. And uh, that's unfortunate because I think it's got a really good engine and trance. All right, come on, Yamaha, Honda. You guys heard this. My challenge to you. What are the new cars to come? Get out here, guys. Um, we need new geometry. I'm going to say something about the Honda. Honda front geometry is pretty badass. I think, actually, the Honda, Honda geometry is the third. You're going to have KRX and you're going to have double uh, uh, X, and then I think the Honda's right there, if not in the middle. Um, they did a good job on the front end. It's too bad they didn't spend the time on the rear. Priorities, know, people, come a on. Lot of, a lot of friends of mine would say that about their women. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> I was going to say the rear Aww. end is just as important as the front end, in my opinion. Well, yes, but we know we know all about you, Chase. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Justin, we have a lot of people wanting to know. A, they wanted to say congratulate you on the fight for the race. You know, I'm not going to mm. knock you for racing against the Jeeps. I mean, I saw it on film. I don't need to tell anyone that. God, but you are so stabbing me in an open wound. I can't believe you went there. People want to know, though. How did the race go, Justin? <laughs> All right, so here's the deal. Um, it's funny that I, I can probably draw things on the board pretty quick, but I have no idea actually how to um, win races at the moment. We had a horrible race at uh, Silver State 300. We, um, we broke a, a belt that was uh, broken in for 20 miles in the first mile, and that's the first time we've ever had that happen. We put another belt on the car, had zero issues the whole time. So we really don't know what happened. It was just a weird, pissed off belt. At 80 miles, we actually broke a shock shaft. Now, hold on a second. We're a shock company and we should never have that happen, um, but that shaft sheared in a weird spot that we've never seen, and we've never seen it on any of our race teams, we've never seen it on our stuff, we've never seen that happen on any of our customers' cars. So it's definitely a weird situation. We've already taken the shaft, sent it back to Fox, and they're doing metallurgical testing, x-ray, and they're doing a heat treat analysis to make sure that there wasn't a problem. We don't think that it was a weird batch of shafts. Um, we think that maybe we had it on the car too long. It had been on the car for over two years, and uh, you know, more than likely these things have a shelf life and we should probably have changed it out a year and a half in. So that put us out down an hour and a half and there was no way we could contend. I mean, the top 10 were within three minutes in this race. So we just finished the race, uh, proud to have finished it. Um, we finished it really hard on the tail end, trying to blow the car up and beat it up as much as we could and use it as a test. So thank you to Kristen Matlock for bringing us a shock. She grabbed it in the pits and brought it out to us. And thanks to our team for putting in the effort and uh, having us follow through with a finish. Hopefully our next race we have a little bit better and more to show for our efforts. Well, thanks, I Chase, for reminding me. Hey. You suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's about it All for right. today's feed you here, guys. You guys have no good questions left, and we're out. Thanks for tuning in on Tech Tuesday. Hopefully I didn't bore you guys completely with all of the stuff on the board. If you have more questions, then put them in the comments. If you have questions about our products, then give us a call at 623-217-4959. If you want to buy some stuff, go to our website, shocktherapist.com.